Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, very warm welcome to the latest of our BAFSA webinars, uh, which we have been running throughout uh, lockdown. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Simon Bird and uh, Stuart Kidd to give us a presentation on BS 9251-2021, uh, which we had to wait a considerable time for because of the number of changes in it. So Simon will be talking about BS 9251. Simon was part of the, the review group that went through uh, the document. And uh, uh, despite all their hard work uh, and unpaid work, uh, there are still a number of questions have come up about 9251. Uh, we have received a number of questions from the audience um, uh, before the presentation. So Simon will answer the majority of these questions throughout the presentation as well as uh, Stuart. Uh, there were some questions we also received which were unconnected uh, with the presentations and we've replied to those by email. If you have any further questions during the presentation, please use the question box uh, on the screen. Uh, we may not have time to answer all the questions, but those that we don't reply to or those that we don't answer, we will reply to after the presentation. We're very fortunate uh, today and at the next presentation in October, uh, we have over 500 people registered for the, the presentations. So thank you very much all for attending, uh, both BAFSA members and uh, those who are not members of BAFSA. Uh, if you like what you see and you're not a member of BAFSA, perhaps you would consider joining us. Uh, all the information on how to join BAFSA is available on our website. Before the presentations, uh, Stuart will be doing his presentation on BSEN 14972. Uh, but before Simon starts the first presentation, we're going to have a, a short animation. This is one of a series of animations we have produced over the last 12 months. And the latest one is about uh, sprinkler protection for housing. Thank you all very much for attending, and I hope you enjoy the presentations. Thank you. Automatic fire sprinklers will protect your family and the things you love. Once installed, sprinklers will automatically protect your home from fire. Fire sprinklers are linked throughout the building you live in by a network of piping connected to a water supply. These pipes can be hidden like most water pipes, but many architects use them as a design feature. The pipes are connected to sprinkler heads recessed in the wall and ceiling, which can be covered by a decor plate, making them invisible. A sprinkler head has a heat-sensitive element which will not respond to burnt toast or steam from a kettle. Each sprinkler head protects an area below and is activated by the heat of a fire. Only the sprinkler closest to a fire will activate, spraying water directly onto the fire. Sprinklers only put water where it is needed. Just one sprinkler head should keep you safe from fire in your bedroom, but in a larger room, more sprinkler heads may be needed to cover the space. Flames and heat damage everything. Treasured possessions, family photographs, clothes and furniture. Sprinklers will protect them all from fire. Thank you, Wendy. Good morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me OK? Right. So, as has been said, I'll be talking to you today about updates to BS 9251, the 2021 edition. It's the um, sprinkler system standard for domestic and residential occupancies, the BSI code of practice. Um, a brief introduction to me and my company. Um, FFSB provide consultancy services. We assist with design and specification of fixed fire fighting systems. We provide design re review services. We conduct failure investigation and expert witness uh, assignments, and we perform special risk assessments. We participate in several BSI and SEN European Standard Committees, um, all in the area of fixed firefighting systems, and we were involved in this latest revision of BS 9251. So I probably don't need to dwell on this um, for this audience, but a sprinkler system is basically a pressurised water supply 
a network of pipes, um, several individual thermally actuated sprinkler heads, and they can be used for life safety and property protection applications. Um, short disclaimer about this presentation, it's intended to be a helpful heads up of changes in the latest version of the standard and some of the reasons for the changes, but the presentation itself may not be exhaustive, um, so you shouldn't rely on the presentation in lieu of reading the standard uh, for yourself in your own application. And the opinions expressed here are mine. Um, I'm not necessarily speaking on behalf of BSI, etc. So if I can just briefly give a little bit of background to the revision, um, I think this is important because it's a reflection of the built environment um, currently in the UK and the environment in which we undertook the review of the standard. So some of you I'm sure will be familiar with the concept of a hierarchy of hazard controls, a pyramid model, um, where at the base of the pyramid you have the more fail-safe, more robust risk reduction measures. And as you move up the pyramid, you have um, different tools, different measures, but they tend to be less effective. So they tend to be less relied upon in the whole strategy for achieving your risk management objective. So historically, I think in the built environment, we probably had um, something a bit like this. So at the bottom of the pyramid, we had eliminate and substitute. And in this context, that would mean eliminating combustion, uh, combustible construction materials and building contents, although you don't really have that much control over that aspect in a residential building. The next level up is engineering controls, and that's things like smoke control, sprinklers, compartmentation, doors, lifts, hydrants. Um, there's also other things a little bit out of our sector, things like the gas regulations, the electrical regulations, furniture regulations, which all have a role in managing fire safety and you know reducing risk. Above that, we have administrative controls. So again, in this context, that might be things like fire strategies, building management, and information for residents. Here you can see the pyramid, and the bottom level is what tended to be the most effective risk management measures, and less so as you move to the top. Okay, and I think today in the built environment, the pyramid isn't really a pyramid anymore. I think we've perhaps lost our way to some extent and um, for example eliminate and substitute in the case of fuels and construction materials clearly we don't use solely non-combustible construction materials to the same extent that we used to building contents um, there's been a general trend for people to have more plastics and more possessions in their homes etc so the pyramid has changed shape i would argue um, one thing we do know, and we do have good data on in our sector, is that sprinklers, and that's sprinklers only, it's not necessarily other types of fixed fire fighting systems, are 94% effective. So although they're halfway up the pyramid, and although they're not a primary means of managing risk, they are a very effective engineering control, and they're all the more valuable given that the pyramid has sort of lost its shape and morphed a bit. So. It's against that backdrop that we very cautiously undertook the revision to BS 9251 2014 edition. Um, that standard was widely regarded as a fairly good standard. Um, and we set out to make only minor and necessary modifications to it. So if I can summarize the background and then I'll launch into the, the changes sort of one by one. Sprinklers are very unlikely to be required um, fires are rare, but when they are required, they have a very critical role to perform. Also, whole life reliability is critical, and that means working when required, so reliably working in a fire, that's obvious, but also not working when not required, so no unwanted discharges or escapes of water, um, an engineering challenge. Good standards are a critical aspect of achieving these objectives and bad or weak standards risk legitimizing and promoting poor practice. So we do need to be careful when amending these standards that we don't get carried away and throw away years of continuous improvement. Um, another aspect of standardization is 
interoperability, which is particularly important in this domain where a system might be fitted to a building and might need to be sort of built into the fabric of the building and needs to be serviced and maintained and updated um, without ripping down walls and ceilings, etc. Okay, so areas that were identified for improvement included um, the 2014 edition having an unclear height limit. Um, there were several areas where readers were urged to think about or consider or assess. Um, this was risk and mitigation, but no actual recommendations were made. And the result of that tended to be the intent was ignored. Um, there's also several areas where improved technical guidance, reference, educational material was warranted. And we've also tried to imp improve the clarity and quantity, uh, quality of information on the understanding it should help to improve outcomes. Um, many of the changes we've made were simply clarifying what was already meant in the spirit of the 2014 edition of the standard. We also had to be mindful of the advent of the British European Standard 1695, that's the European um, Residential and Domestic Standard. It only goes up to buildings of 18 metres or four storeys in height, so it has a fairly limited scope of application, which was why in the UK, one of the main reasons we felt we needed to keep BS9251 in one form or another, because many of our residential buildings wouldn't really have a, a tailor-made standard otherwise, um, being taller than 18 metres. So our revision to 9251 had to be at least as good as BSEN 16925, and we wanted, we needed it to be usable for buildings of any height within reason in the UK. And just a sort of general reminder here, it's almost universally overlooked that standards are setting minima. Um, you don't have to default to the minimum letter of the standard. It's almost always possible and sometimes necessary to do more than a standard would recommend. So we've updated the front matter. So this is things like the forward and the introduction to the standard. We've updated the references to reflect, you know, publications, relevant publications that have come along in the intervening period. Um, a particularly notable one is BS5306 part naught, the guide for selection of installed systems and other fire equipment. Um, the forward acknowledges the existence of 16925. Um, it also delicately flags that the UK committee had a few concerns about the standard 16925 and the preference in the UK for simplicity um, and for cohesion is that really BS 9251 can and should be used for pretty much all domestic and residential buildings. Um, reference to BS 9252 for sprinkler heads has been removed, it's been superseded by the European standard EN 12259 part 14. Um, pretty basic stuff here, but we clarified the definition of a building height. We tried to align it with the method used in approved document B, which is actually not, um, not that simple, not that straightforward. It, effectively, building height is number three on this figure. So it's from the lowest access point to the floor of the uppermost story, ignoring plants on the roof. So a bit convoluted, but when we say building height, we mean number three. Um, we also clarify a few other definitions, and these are important in the context of things like the Hackett Review, which um, you know reminds everyone of the importance for chains of custody of information and responsibility throughout the construction supply chain. So we've clarified who's a client. Um, we've also uh, spelt out other roles like specifier, um, the fire engineer, and that sort of thing. Um, we found it necessary to define a compartment, brackets fire, as opposed to a compartment, brackets sprinkler. A compartment fire is like is typically used in approved document B, so walls and a door, etc., and ceiling with a particular fire and smoke resisting period, whereas a sprinkler compartment can be to interconnected compartments with something like a lintel or a downstand. It's, it's more to do with the coverage area of protection of a sprinkler head rather than the movement of smoke and fire. Shadow area. Um, so the next slide will give a, an illustration of what we mean here. So if number three on that figure is your sidewall sprinkler head, 
and you've got a beam in the corner of a room, this white area here, number one, the black triangle, is a shadow area. So we now define maximum areas in meters squared of shadow area that are permissible in various scenarios. That just simply wasn't covered in the old standard. So that's a worthwhile addition. One of the big changes that's been most talked about is the introduction of a new category, um, category four. So the background to this is, as I've already mentioned, BS 9251 2014 wasn't particularly clear on its height limit. I've highlighted in red here the various statements it contained about building height. So one of them is buildings can be up to a maximum of 49, 45 metres in height. And then it says or for buildings over 45 metres in height. And then it talks about additional measures, but without actually specifying what those additional measures are. So no one really knew what to do with this unclear text. There were various interpretations of what to do. Sometimes it was viewed as a hard limit. Sometimes it was viewed as a, you might want to do something else, but often something else didn't happen. So we've grasped that nettle. One of the, one of the sort of topics of discussion around this issue was the fire doesn't really know what floor it's on. So why does it matter? And therefore, why do we need these categories? And, increasing um, areas of operation and pressures and flows at higher building heights. Well, I think the simple answer to that is building height is a crude approximation to risk profile, um, hazard and consequence. So clearly in a two-story dwelling, you can escape from the ground floor or the second floor without too much difficulty for most people. Um, a medium rise getting a bit more difficult and high rise clearly no chance. So. It's, it's pretty obvious you are very dependent on these systems, the more so the higher a building gets. Um, why did we choose the numbers we did choose? So we discussed this at length. Um, you won't be surprised here. So 45 metres kind of came across from BS 9251 2014 edition, but it didn't in itself have any particular basis. It's not to be confused with the 45 metres in LPC rules 12845, which is purely a hydraulic consideration. It's nothing to do with the risk profile, which is actually what we're talking about here. Um, around the world and in lots of other legislation, 18 metres is a figure that just jumps out and keeps reoccurring. Maybe it has some historic origins, maybe it's to do with ladders, I don't know. Um, but the fact is, there's lots of evidence to support the use of 18 metres as being a, a threshold where risk profile significantly starts to change or changes. None to support 45. So that's why we went with 18 metres. Um, we actually would have liked to have included, or some of us would have liked to have included care homes in category four being the higher risk category. Um, but we felt we couldn't disappointingly because in England sprinklers are not mandated in most care homes and currently many care home owners are voluntarily installing sprinklers in their premises if we were to make care homes into category four the the concern was that would increase the cost um, and may deter people who are voluntarily installing sprinklers at the moment so a very delicate balance there so this is what category four looks like in table two, the minimum design parameters table. It's very similar to category three, actually. Um, the most conspicuous difference is the minimum duration of supply, which we've increased from 30 minutes to 60 minutes. And that's really, um, to simplify, that's to allow fire and rescue services more time to arrive at the site, enter the building, assemble all their equipment, and um, conduct their operations in a higher rise building, which obviously is slower and more complicated. That's the main reason that's in there. I'll come on to the little footnote E later. Um, so other features of the category four system, which you'll find later in the text of the standard are the requirement for an enhanced water supply, which could be, for example, a town main fed from both ends, or it could be split capacity tanks, half capacity, two half capacity tanks giving 100%, plus two or more pumps. Um, duplicate electrical supplies um, are required at the height of 18 metres if it's a new build and above 45 metres in a retrofit. And the reason for that sort of demarcation is most new build buildings over 18 metres in height will include a firefighting shaft, which requires a duplicate power supply already. So 
we didn't think there was much or any new cost there by aligning with that philosophy. But the exception is in retrofit buildings, which obviously is a big market at the moment, um, you often don't have a duplicate supply because you wouldn't have had the same firefighting shaft requirement. So as a compromise, reflecting that we were moving from a position where duplicate supplies were never required in the 9251 system, that's where we drew the line. Um, We've also introduced into the standard um, requirements for protection akin to ordinary hazard 12845 protection. I should stress it's limited areas only. And the reason we did that is twofold. Uh, one, the European standard does it. And two, it needed doing because most residential buildings do include limited areas of non-residential occupancy. For example, you almost always have a bin store. Um, you'll have other areas like concierge offices, um, you might have small car parks, or well, you might have large car parks, but large car parks wouldn't be within the scope of what we've done here, etc. There's a long list of non-residential occupancies that you typically find in a residential building. So we've ported across the requirements that can be used um, more appropriately for those scenarios. Um, another sort of side note, really, the committee has at all times really tried hard to consider cost versus benefit. Um, we've gone to great lengths to ensure that everything we've changed was done so for a good reason um, and the cost wasn't disproportionate, but equally the, the technical justification had to stack up as well. Um, a few clarifications. So table one, the old table one, category one system, we were finding Category one systems were being abused and used in blocks of flats, which was never the intention. It was never intended that a category one system could be used to protect an entire block of flats on the basis that each flat is an individual dwelling. Um, so that's been tidied up and corrected in the 2021 edition. We've tried to clarify the types of alarms and fault signals that a system should generate and how they should be treated, relayed and handled. Um, so these faults and fire alarm conditions in table five, these apply for category two, three and four systems. So everything above a single dwelling house basically. And these are the signals and these are how they should be um, triggered. So for example, valve position monitoring is required on all valves now that can control the flow of water to sprinklers. We did that for several reasons. Technically, it's a good thing to do, but most, I think the clincher was the European standard requires it. And as we're trying to be at least as good as the European standard, we needed to do it. Um, a relatively low cost improvement was to introduce the concept of supervised circuits. So end of line resistors to allow the control panel to know if something critical has become disconnected. Um, trace heating faults, we've um, just specified that trace heating operational status should be monitored. Um, we've also tried to clarify the low level alarm set points, so water level, tank water level set points. It wasn't clear in the old standard, some say. Um, we've worded the standard quite loosely in some respects in regard to alarms and faults, and that's because there's just simply so many ways to implement alarm and fault monitoring functionality. It has to be consistent with um, the fire strategy for the building, whether there is an on-site presence or not at the building, what existing alarm equipment exists at the building, etc. You must come up with a coherent solution is the message. And there's several exemplars on how to do that. Um, the 2014 edition always had self-testing pumps. Um, I think the requirement was for a monthly automatic self-test cycle. It didn't really tell you what had to be tested and how. We've increased the interval to weekly, which really shouldn't technically be a big change. It's just a sort of software change really to achieve that. Um, and we've given a bit more detail on how pumps should start and what should be tested in the process of doing the automatic test. And obviously that's motivated towards achieving more reliable, resilient, more available pump sets. Um, so we're now recommending that two normally closed pressure switches should be used to start the pump or one pressure switch and one transducer. They should be configured fail safe, as fail safe as possible. The devices should be tested in the um, weekly test. Um, yeah. 
here's a sort of just for information really just a flowchart on how the logic actually looks um, when you translate what we've written down into an actual um, PID type diagram. We we give much more guidance on power supplies. Um, I d there was very little guidance in the previous standard, which was a bit of a conspicuous gap. So although there are, this does give rise to new questions and it, it doesn't fully specify every aspect of electrical configuration, there is a lot more information here on um, where you should start and how you should configure electrical supplies for the various configurations. So the figures here, we've got um, a generator, we've got two independent grid supplies, and we've got UPS backup, and then we've just got a single supply at the top. So back to the topic of non-residential areas or areas akin to ordinary hazard. So the background to this is that residential sprinkler heads produce a wide parabolic water distribution pattern and they're designed to wet the walls, wet the curtains, wet the perimeter of the room where you typically have most of your furniture, yourselves, your sofa, etc. Um, they are highly optimized heads. They deliver quite low densities of water in that particular spray pattern, as I've just described. Um, so they are optimized for that particular application. So if you can imagine, that's not going to be particularly effective necessarily in a bin store where you would want most of the water jetting down into the bin. Um, as a crude example. So limited areas, and it's up to 100 metres squared, of non-residential building use can be protected um, as per the instructions in BS 9251. So examples would include bin stores, car parks or garages, small car parks only, offices, so concierge offices or small sort of community support offices, or sometimes these even are commercial offices. They are sometimes rented out, but they do tend to be tiny. Um, plant rooms, again, plant rooms in residential buildings tend to be a few bits of metal, motors, gas boilers, water tanks, pumps, very limited combustible load. Um, stores, tenants, cubicles or storage sheds, these are uncontrolled areas where you can get quite dense fire loading, quite weird substances stored, so they're a bit tricky. Um, small areas of retail, sometimes you get a little coster or similar on the ground floor of a building. Commercial kitchens and laundries, as you would typically find in a care home. Um, I think most would agree they're, they're not residential occupancies and therefore residential sprinkler heads wouldn't necessarily be the right choice. So we typically specify design criteria like use a commercial sprinkler head, a KAC for example, the maximum coverage area of the head should be 12 meters squared, use a density of five millimeters a minute minimum, the AMAO, in table four would be 72 meters squared, which is equivalent to OH1, or 100 meters squared for anything else. And in 12845, the um, areas of operation for OH2 and OH3 would be 144 and 216. But we don't specify that here because that would be very confusing given that we've already said the maximum area you can protect is 100 meters squared, which is why it's capped at 100 meters squared. Um, here's how the tables look, um, lists of occupancies and then which criteria to use. Sometimes you can use residential criteria or commercial criteria and sometimes you have to use one or the other. Um, that's just uh, according to what we felt would give rise to the appropriate protection. There is one possible mistake in this table which is under discussion at the moment, plant rooms. Um, it says use C table four, which means use commercial heads. And then it says minimum number of design sprinklers. It says as per table two. So that would either be two, three or four heads, depending on the area of the compartment. But slightly contradicting that possibly is table four saying 100 meters squared. So we need to look at that and possibly issue an interpretation or a clarification on that particular point. Otherwise, it seems to be working fairly well. I think it's got to be read very carefully. Um, you have to read all clauses in the standard, even if you're not using them. So do read those sections from top to tail. Um, right. Another question that comes up on this topic is non-residential areas. Is the 100 meters squared cumulative or per compartment? Well, the intent was originally it was cumulative. So we didn't want people to be abusing the standard and using it when 12845 all the LPC rules should have been used, but somehow in the um, machinations at BSI, 
that statement's not as clear as it might have been. So that might be another thing to clarify. Um, footnote E. So I'm back to table two now, which is the category of system and design parameters. And the 60 minutes that is required for a category four system, it has a footnote E beside it. And this is a sort of compromise um, based on the, the rationale for it becoming 60 minutes in the first place. The thinking was, at the base of a building, if you have an ordinary hazard akin area, you might not necessarily need 60 minutes of water supply because the fire and rescue service are not going to struggle to reach the bin store or the concierge office or whatever it is on the ground floor. So with their agreement, those types of area on the ground floor or low floors, it might be okay to design for a 30 minute water supply. And that can reduce some of the sting of uh, cost and tank size of jumping from 30 minutes to 60 minutes. Um, tank sizing and low level switches. So uh, more detail is provided than was given in the old standard. So shared tank design, this is tank design um, where it's shared between the sprinkler system and the domestic water supply service. It's quite complicated. It's perhaps more complicated than meets the eye. It should require collaboration between designers. So the sprinkler designer will need to talk to the m &E or the domestic services designer because neither will know what the other requires. Um, I, occasionally I've seen low level water switches simply floating in tanks. Obviously that's not the right thing to do. They have to be installed at the correct level so that they can do what they need to do. Um, dead volumes obviously need to be considered in sizing the tank and the water supply um, and that's covered in figure four the various or three examples of how suction or tank outlet arrangements can typically be configured the figure on the right we've got the two shared tank supply scenarios which are commonly encountered the the top one a b c and d is a shared supply with no priority demand valve so it doesn't this system doesn't have the ability to turn off the domestic water supply and because of that you basically need two lots of domestic water supply you need c at the top of the tank for your normal daily fluctuations and use and below c the low level water alarm will trigger and below that for for good measure you've got an additional the buffer um, um, which is probably the same size as the domestic demand then below that b is the sprinkler system um, required volume of water the variation of that below is you do have a priority demand valve so quite simply once the residential water volume is consumed which should never happen if it's been designed correctly switch two will turn off the supply to the domestic part of the system thus you've preserved your sprinkler water and you're getting an alarm that something's gone quite seriously wrong and you need to do something about it if the tank's been designed incorrectly in either case, you're going to get lots of nuisance alarms, which instead of being muted, should prompt a re-evaluation of the design and um, rectification if required. CPVC pipe work, um, great product if used correctly, can go horribly wrong if you use it wrong. Um, it's a, this is just a reminder for users of the product at install and through life to follow the instructions. A couple of things that are commonly overlooked in my experience are CPVC pipe work quite often requires an increased density. So if you're using extended coverage heads or other scenarios like it is not installed behind 30 minute rated fire resisting construction, you need to use the increased density of 4.1 millimeters a minute. Um, the pipe pipe work itself it shouldn't be crushed stressed or clamped because it is prone to stress fracturing in uh, if provoked and it's chemically sensitive so it mustn't be exposed to incompatible chemicals and that applies at the time of install or shortly after the install when the fire stopping person is coming around or at any time through life so if you've got pesticide you know pest control in uh, decorators in whatever uh, if you're doing other building work you can't taint the products with incompatible chemicals um, just read the instructions I'll just fly through a few of the other changes and then that will bring my presentation to a close um, I've already mentioned more guidance on roles and responsibilities client spring system designer client representative there's um, slightly improved guidance on compensatory scenarios and that touches on older buildings uh, where sprinklers are used in conjunction with BS 991 
um, where fire and rescue service access is compromised, other doubts. Um, there's a clearer consolidated set of requirements on vulnerability characteristics and risk profiles. It used to be in the main body of the standard and in the annex, it's now all in one place. Um, it now, the standard now also suggests um, specifiers might want to include fire and rescue service inlets. That's so that the fire and rescue service can turn up at site and with their appliance can pump water directly into the sprinkler system. If unless it's an extremely tall building, it's probably better to do that downstream of the pump and tanks. So if there's a problem with the sprinkler tank or the sprinkler pumps, you're bypassing all of that and putting more water through the sprinkler system. If it's a very tall building, you might need to put it in the into the tank because the um, fire appliance might not be able to pump it all the way out of the building. That's a job for the designer to figure that one out. Um, we also include reference to remote pressure and flow test points. So these are test points which allow you to prove that water will go in the bottom of the system and come out the top at the correct pressure and flow. Sometimes with pipe work you get um, foreign matter in it. Adhesive can web sometimes if it's poorly applied and that's a good way to check for those phenomena which you can't do by visual inspection once the system's closed. Um, We've made some clarifications to permitted exceptions, so things like stairwells, bathrooms, um, cupboards, etc. And we are encouraging here people to properly assess the risk, as was always intended, but it, the wording was a bit light touch before. We've flagged that you can use orifice plates, and that's really a concession um, to designers to allow them to help mitigate some of the additional costs of the new standard. Um, you can achieve a more efficient hydraulic design by using orifice plates. I should stress, actually, my recent experience of using the standard is sometimes it costs more and sometimes it costs less. So it's not black and white and it's generally, it wouldn't be fair to say it costs more, period. That's not the case. Um, requirements and limitations have been placed on the use of pressure reducing valves and priority demand valves. Um, both devices which increase the complexity of the system and have maintenance and um, uh, implications. We've added a new section, which is a bit like EN12845 Annex F, the long-term inspection and testing of pipework and sprinklers. Previously, we didn't go beyond one year maintenance in the standard, which was a bit of a gap. Um, water supply sizing, yeah, done that. Um, there's a lot more uh, guidance and exemplars in the appendices at the back of the document on how to do the hydraulic calculations, so how to correctly calculate densities and pressures and flows given various areas of head coverage you might actually achieve in a real life installation. It's quite complicated, but designers need to work through that and understand that. So, in summary, considering this is meant to be a minor revision, I hope you would all agree that we've made many very worthwhile improvements. Um, it's all done by volunteer time. I've talked about cost versus benefit. That's the end of my presentation. I'll now hand over to Stuart and obviously look forward to taking your questions at the end of the session. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, try and encapsulate um, key features of this new European standard, uh, uh, which is 113 pages, um, without either boring you or boring myself. Um, before I do, let's just run through what's been happening. Um, the greater demand for aware, awareness of fire suppression systems is of course a welcome trend. Um, and this is uh, credit is due to the UK Fire Service and, uh, and the FPA and insurers uh, and the wider use of uh, suppression as tools to protect both people and property from the effects of fire. Um, the danger is, however, that these hardware advances could be undermined by systems that haven't undergone the same rigorous testing and scrutiny as the long established uh, fire suppression systems like sprinklers. Let's face it, sprinklers have been around since 1870. Um, effectively, water mist has only been around for the last 25 or 30 years. Um, so it, it is um, a, a threat to uh, credibility. Uh, and this is perhaps why insurers um, have not gone overboard uh, to uh, encourage the wider use of water mist. Um, I think the, the other issue is the need that, that the regulators and enforcers um, need to be alert to issues regarding innovative systems, particularly packaged water mist systems, 
which um, may not necessarily uh, comply with any of the existing standards. Uh, and given that um, compliance is not just a matter of uh, complying with the BS for design, is also a need for the installer to be uh, certificated and the components to be certificated. And, and this, is, this is something that will come out in 14972, but perhaps with a bit more flexibility than we might like. Um, BASA's objectives are to make sure that the reputation of fire protection systems is not damaged, provide representation for mismanufacturers and installers, uh, promote the highest standard of design, installation, and utilization, critically examine proposals coming from SEN, um, which we do through the um, BSI FSH 18.5 committee, uh, ensure that appropriate standard certification supports wider misdevelopment and applications, recognize the benefits of new technology, and encourage training schemes for designers and installers, uh, as we're doing for with sprinkler installers and designers. Um, there's a BAFSA water mist group, which sits alongside the domestic sprinkler group as part of the BASA Technical Committee. It's represented on the BS 18.5 committee. It plays a key role in ensuring that mist is subject to scrutiny. It works with the F FIA BAFSA mist working group. Uh, any BAFSA member can attend its meetings and it will develop jointly with the FIA and fire service guidance documents. Okay, so what advances have we got made in recent years? Uh, recognition of automatic fire suppression systems in legislation and building standards, i.e. the Welsh measure, um, design guidance as BS 9999 and 9991, uh, both, by the way, under review. Uh, 9991 will be coming out uh, sometime in October, uh, and the Scottish Animal Handbooks and Approved Document B. Uh, recommendations in BS 5306 Part 0, which I commend to you, uh, it's a very useful document because it does what 4972 doesn't do. It tells you where you can use water mist systems uh, effectively. Uh, and I think that's um, a useful thing to have. Um, we've now had Welsh government guidance on use of mist as an alternative for sprinklers. Um, this is the, the document on the right published in August, uh, mainly drafted by BRE. Sadly, um, it was circulated in draft and comments were made and there was supposed to be a, an online uh, seminar to discuss comments, but this didn't take place. So some of the uh, uh, parts of the, the document might, might possibly have been improved. Um, we understand, but we don't know, but we understand that uh, the intention is that the document will be enforced by building control or approved inspectors in Wales where water mist is being offered an alternative to sprinklers under the regulation 37a and the domestic fire safety measure. We also understand that it has quote been cascaded down uh, in Scotland to Scottish building standards uh, and to the building control officers and uh, the Dean of Guild and so forth in, in various uh, local authorities. So it's worth thinking about. The interesting thing is that there are uh, significant um, de declarations to be made at the end uh, by installers about compliance. And, and these very closely match the declarations required in the UK version, i.e. BSEN 14972 part one. Uh, so I, I guess um, in very broadly speaking, if you comply with the BS, you're almost certainly gonna comply uh, with the declaration parts of the Welsh Guide, which is helpful. Um, 14972 part one was published on 30th of June. Um, the UK Mirror Committee, 18.5, had significant reservations about the quality of the standard. Um, in, in particular, it felt that uh, many of the test protocols uh, were suboptimal to those uh, recommendations in the 8489 series and to those protocols that have been in use in the UK to date. Um, the UK committee also had concerns about uh, specification for system design application, limits of application, the incomplete suite of test protocols, and uh, an overwhelming reliance on the uh, manufacturer, not the installer, the manufacturer's design, installation, operates, and maintenance manuals. Uh, uh, many critical parameters are governed by this, and you'll, you'll see this as we go through. 
some parts of the standard. Um, presently, BSI have not yet withdrawn 8458-8489. Uh, there is a commitment by BSI uh, in red at the bottom to adopt all European standards and withdraw conflicting national standards as appropriate, irrespective of its voting stance. So even though uh, the, the FSH 5 committee voted against the standard consistently and frequently over most of its uh, development, uh, BSI uh, have gone ahead and published the standard, which many people think, in the committees at least, think is ill-advised. However, um, you will be aware that 8489 has, has uh, a part one design installation, part four local application, five combustion turbines, six industrial oil cookers, and seven low hazard occupancies. Uh, so some of that is mirrored uh, in the 14972 standards, as you'll see. Um, however, we need to consider also product standards. Um, the 8663 part one, 2019, is the only UK standard for water mist nozzle testing. Uh, not uh, apparently well known, uh, and we still see um, people offering other standards. Uh, sadly, um, as far as we're aware, to date, nobody has yet uh, had a completion of testing to the standard. And uh, um, part of this is due apparently to the time it takes, but also there have been comments about the delays uh, in, involved and the costs. Um, you can't test nozzles in isolation just by saying, oh, Annex C of 8458 proves our nozzle works. Uh, it might well do, but the, the test standard is a lot more than just the operation of a test. It's to do with the method of construction, its, it's resilience, its resistance, and its reliability. So uh, don't overlook that. Um, there's an LPS 1283 for low housing commercial systems which is actually being used, I believe. 12845 for domestic residential systems, uh, 1233 for range, hood and kitchen systems, and 1655 is for personal protection systems. These are single room systems, and despite some claims, these systems cannot be daisy chained to protect more than one room. Uh, why you'd want to do that, I don't know, because the cost of one of these systems is around about 2,000 pounds for a single room. Uh, which uh, is not far off the cost of a sprinkler system for, for one, one bedroom flat. Uh, and two of these together is uh, obviously £4,000. Um, other standards, FIRAS and IFCC have missed installer schemes. And there are something like uh, seven or eight FIRAS and five IFCC companies listed. Um, there are four nozzle manufacturers listed in Red Book Live. Um, LPC BRE have made it very clear in block capitals and bold in Red Book that a listing for a nozzle doesn't mean that any system which uses that nozzle will automatically be compliant. In other words, the system and the nozzle both have to be compliant. BRE issue experiment reports as well as test reports. They are not the same. Uh, as a consultant, I have been uh, asked to audit and review the installation of water mist systems in properties, and I'm often given uh, one of these global experiment reports uh, as um, evidence that a, a product has been tested or has somehow been BRE approved. Uh, they're not. This is misuse of the system. Uh, sadly, BRE is not as good at policing its, uh, its name as it might be. Um, for a water mist system to be compliant, the following must be in place. A listed nozzle, a listed installer, and approval system. Now, it, we should note that some innovative systems, such as the Plumis Smart Scan and Auto Scan, have designs that sit outside the parameters of these standards. So compliance is not possible. So it's a little unfair, and I'm guilty of this, uh, in saying that they're not compliant, uh, that they aren't compliant, but they couldn't comply because the standards don't permit their, uh, the technology they use. So we need to somehow fix this problem. Um, BS. Uh, FSH 18.5 uh, has been asked to consider either a part two to, to 8458 uh, to allow plumage type systems, um, which are basically um, uh, dynamic nozzles with uh, external detection 
uh, for domestic use. And I, I don't see why that shouldn't be possible. Uh, I'm very keen that uh, Plumis uh, efforts should be recognized um, and that uh, we, we should ensure that we get the same reliability and uh, uh, rigor uh, that, that uh, we have in traditional systems. Okay, um, so 14972 is a suite of standards. Part one is uh, the design and installation. Part two, shopping centers, part three, and so on. Um, I'm, I'm not going to, to, to bore you with going through all of these, but you can see uh, it's a fairly comprehensive set of test protocols, um, which should cover uh, the majority of applications where water is to be appropriate. Um, I guess we're seeing some concerns about uh, part three, offices, schools, classrooms, and hotels, uh, and I'll come back to that later. What's been published so far is part one. We've also had um, uh, component parts published, 17450 for strainers, 17452 for nozzles. Uh, this is still in a draft form. Uh, there was a devout and, and sincere hope that um, they would base this document on BS 8663 part one, but that has not yet happened as far as I know, and it's not clear to me whether that would be possible. It will be a great shame if it's not, because it means essentially that we're going to have to withdraw 8663 part one uh, under the uh, Vienna agreement. Um, there's also uh, draft um, standards for check valves, control deluge valves, actuators, and pressure switches. Uh, they're all in, in final draft form and going out for vote. So uh, the uh, test protocols so far published, part one is published, obviously, part two, part three, uh, part eight, nine, 10, um, 14, 15, and 16. Um, many of those are similar to or identical to the test protocols already under 8489, or to FM um, or other uh, internationally agreed documents. So uh, no huge problem there. There is a problem with part two. I'm not sure what a shopping area is. Uh, clearly, um, a, a 250 square meter mini mart in a bottom of a tower block is very different from Selfridges uh, or from uh, Blue Water or whatever. And I think uh, that's a problem. And I think, as I say, part three might be a problem, but we'll perhaps come back to that. So what's in the standard? Uh, part, there are 10 sections um, mirroring very much uh, 12845 to some extent and 9251 in its layout. Um, there are annexes. Uh, Annex A is very useful. It uh, guides you on developing that protocol for an area that's not covered by one of the existing protocols. And it also covers uh, areas of operation for automatic nozzle water mist systems. There are four national annexes, which were uh, intended to try and compensate for some of the concerns expressed by 18.5. Uh, NA is water mist, nozzle water mist systems. Uh, NB is contracts declaration conformity. NC is changes to 49.72. Uh, one which were requested by 18.5, but weren't carried out. And ND is a, a glossary of additional terms, definition of phrases, which 18.5 felt were missing. So the scope uh, is the design, installation, inspection, and maintenance of all types of fixed land based water mist systems. It covers both automatic nozzle systems and deluge systems supplied by standalone or pumped systems. Uh, I'm using the actual wording from the standard in most cases. And quite frankly, it's not always as clear as it might be, uh, whether this is to do with uh, the fact that uh, it, it's syntax from non-native English speakers, I don't know. But certainly there's some confusion on parts of the standard. Um, it only covers applications, occupancies covered by the test protocols. And it doesn't cover explosion protection systems or use of the vehicles. It does not, and it says this quite clearly, cover all legislative requirements. In certain countries, it says that specific national regulations apply and take precedence over this document. 
users are advised to make themselves aware of these uh, non-applicability uh, and uh, look at what's required. Uh, note, please, in England, approved document B part one does not call up 14972 for use of premises where the top floor is above 11 meters. Uh, so basically you're stuck with sprinklers at the moment in there. Uh, this is a reflection perhaps that the regulators shared 18.5's concerns about the standard. Um, in the UK, national NXA should be complied with. Um, systems uh, extensively uh, must comply with the DIOM. I'll use that term in the future. Uh, and for specific hazards, uh, it must follow the protocols of manufacturers of DIOM. Installing companies must be trained in this by the manufacturer. Uh, where an application is not covered by a fire test protocol, you should use it, uh, the testing procedure letter in Annex A. The standard covers high and low pressure systems and systems cover pressurized by pumps and atomizing gas gases. And it covers thermally operated systems as well as nozzle systems with external protection. Local application, pre-action, deluge, and zone systems are all permitted. Um, I find it quite strange that there's actually uh, no real um, delineation between high and low pressure systems in the standard. It, it's barely mentioned uh, the difference. So um, National NXA uh, covers the application of nozzles. It um, suggests that the table one um, has been taken from 40 and 72 test protocols due to seven and part 17. So it's only possible to use some of the design area set out in that table. Uh, the remaining roads they will have no reference protocols and should not be used until they're published. Um, I think risk assessment, uh, as always, is, is to be followed. And uh, the standard suggests that you, you can follow uh, risk assessment um, using uh, the subclauses of 14072 and 536 part zero. Um, you could also, I think, without any real stretching of the imagination, use the test protocols that already exist in 84897 and 8458. Uh, so that, that would be perhaps one way of uh, reconciling the, the introduction of the European standard. So um, I'm not going to read, read out all the text here, we'll be here all day, uh, but th there's the requirements in, in NA2 on nozzles. Um, and it does suggest that um, uh, clear use uh, should be made uh, using the appropriate fire test data. Um, ceiling height in the building should be defined the application limit and where testing has only been carried out using flat ceilings, additional fire testing should be carried out. And that's an omission we've seen on a number of locations where uh, an XC testing to 8458 has taken place in a nice square test rig uh, with right angle sides and of course if a ceiling is provided, it's a flat ceiling. Ventilation should be considered. Uh, I think most people will be aware that water mist systems um, behave more like gases when they discharge their, their gas, their water, and therefore uh, those, those clouds of uh, mist droplets uh, can behave a bit like a gas uh, and can in fact be moved by high velocity uh, uh, air. Uh, and therefore, um, that uh, suggests that um, uh, certainly significant attention should be paid to the impact of airflow, uh, which might require additional fire testing. Uh, likewise, on obstructions, um, we, we, we know this from, from bitter experience with sprinklers, uh, cable trays, light fitting, ducts, beams and columns, all uh, conspire to drive the sprinkler designer batty. Um, I think um, clearly with mist, uh, obstructions could be overcome by uh, either additional testing or additional nozzles. Uh, and that would certainly be worth looking at. Um, the UK uh, and, uh, asked for several changes be made. One on blow off caps, uh, pipe supports, um, centrifugal pump uh, and displacement pump 
uh, the test criteria requirements um, in, in 8.2, um, it does require verification of test points and the, um, the operation uh, at the lowest flow rate of the system. And um, there's a requirement that um, containers, i.e. cylinders, should be subject to periodic tests as required by below natural standards, yeah, i.e. compressed gas cylinders in the UK. Um, there were some missing uh, definitions. I'm not going to go through those. I, I would have a personal view here that the word section is frequently used in the standard, and I think it needs to be clearly defined, uh, as you'll see as we go through. So Annex A, as I say, sets out criteria for applications not covered if you're going to undertake additional testing. Uh, it requires that tests comply with 16730 ISO and uh, undertaken only by organizations who can use ISO 17025 and are competent. Uh, test results must be set out in a form uh, which will comply with A8 of the Annex. So again, I'm not going to go through that. So the DIOM uh, I've mentioned before, the Design, Installation, Operation and Maintenance Manual, uh, the standard sets out what should be in the DIOM, uh, and that's all fairly self-evident. I don't think anything new there, or I don't think anyone would take any objection to. Um, the concern I think is expressed is that um, it leaves so much to the manufacturer, uh, which um, could well deviate from the standard or from any other standard. Um, DIOM uh, also covers uh, the use of obstructions, types of fire detection system if used in the fire test. Uh, it covers critical components, mineral requirements for water and gas, hydronic calculations, use of additives, uh, explanation of the use of additives, and constraints to the operation of the system, including cover plates, guards, and ancillaries. Um, the test protocol uh, needs to include um, the fire test reference in the dial um, with a full functional system description, full installation commissioning instructions, full operating instructions, full maintenance and service, lifetime intervals and instructions, and distances from the hazard. And these are covered later in the, in the standard uh, where it sets out uh, maintenance and requirements and installation and uh, documentation. So the, um, just to pause for a second. A few um, observations rather than going through the, the detail. Um, activation should be automatic except for uh, deluge systems, which require an additional manual release located outside the protected area. Uh, not new uh, if you've been involved in, in uh, water spray systems, but clearly um, fairly new in things like water mist systems. Um, the extent of protection is covered, um, which is all areas within the building except where permitted exceptions. Um, and you're allowed to omit, after due consideration, washrooms and toilets, constructed of combustible material, uh, enclosed staircases and enclosed vertical shafts, rooms protected by other firefighting systems, wet processes, small cupboards, and locations where water can uh, cause additional harm. Uh, now, I, I have to say, once again, I'm concerned about emission of washrooms and toilets because I know from my own experience and from uh, several uh, post-fire investigations that these are favorite targets, especially in schools and community buildings for the arsonist. Uh, and we've recently had a couple of uh, sprinkler saves uh, in educational buildings in schools where the uh, sprinkler system in the toilets, which was uh, uh, not re requested by the consultant, but was put in anyway, actually save the building. Um, if um, the fire could uh, involve more than one hazard, then the system must be designed for the most onerous, obviously. Um, the hydraulic calculations, as per uh, all other fire suppression standards, must cover minimum maximum pressure and flow requirements uh, and show that these are met for the most unfavorable and favorable areas of operation. Uh, you should use um, where there's different classifications for hazards, maximum pressures, 
based on the most onerous with regard to level pressure. And the designers provide calculations showing the water supply is adequate for the most favorable operation uh, for, for the specified operating time. Now, um, again, the hydraulic calculation should be based on minimum design area or minimum nozzle quantity, whichever is the greater. Uh, and that's familiar to many people, I suspect. So uh, what are the design areas? Uh, shopping storage areas. Uh, again, there's a slightly different term from uh, shopping facilities, 216 meters square, uh, but there's no test protocol for that yet. So we don't have to worry about it. Uh, cellular offices and open plan offices, counters, restaurants, kitchens, public areas and buildings. There's a huge group of uh, occupancies there. Nursing homes, classrooms, recreation areas, churches, museums. 72 meters squared, maximum of six nozzles. Um, apartments, more churches, uh, concealed spaces, gymnasiums, hospitals, 140 square meters, nine nozzles. Uh, Non-stacking garages, i.e. that's um, uh, car parts without car stackers. Fully enclosed garages, 144 meters square wet, 180 meters square dry. Uh, I have to say that worries me from my own experience. Uh, false ceilings uh, between 300 mil and 800 mil, 72 meters squared, six nozzles. Uh, again, we're back to apartments and churches, uh, concealed spaces, hospitals, libraries, and museums. So lots of opportunity for confusion there, in my opinion. Um, dwelling houses. Uh, transportable homes. Uh, nice to have that in the standard, I have to say, because uh, we've seen recently several fires involving mobile homes. Um, HMOs, uh, again, that's a difficult one. Bed and breakfast accommodation, boarding houses and blocks of flats of 80 metres or less in height. The maximum total floor area of 2,100 square metres, 64 metres squared. Uh, all nozzles installed in the rooms with the most numbers of nozzles, up to a maximum of two. Again, I can see some of some real problems there in some areas. Blocks of flats greater than 18 meters, up to 45 meters. Um, then we've got 64 square meters again. So some, some issues. Um, in the design uh, criteria, wet pipes only permitted when temperature drops below four. Sorry, wet pipe system uh, only permitted where. Trace heating is provided if it drops below 4C. Dry pipe can be used below 4C. Uh, Pre-action can be used, again, as per the dion. Uh, wet pipe and pre-action not to exceed 10,000 square meters per control valve. That's uh, quite, a, quite a big space uh, uh, for, for a single valve. Nozzle temperatures should be close to available, but not less than 30C, higher than the maximum expected ambient temperature unless permitted by the diom. So there's a get out there. If the diom says something different, you can do it. Nozzle spacing at point of the diom again. Alarm devices are installed on each system or control valve to detect opening of a single nozzle and remain operating while there's water flow. Uh, alarms connected to public soft location. Again, nothing new here. Alarm test connection for each system or control valve. Um, you must take into account the maximum velocity, air velocity, that's uh, discussed that. Uh, where possible, ventilation systems should be shut down. I, I have to say that that worries me. I think it should be compulsory. Um, HV systems uh, to equip with the protected area to be switched off on acquisition of this system. Again, it may not be possible. Uh, there's exclusion for emergency systems, I suppose. Uh, we're not possible, provisions are going to the die on. So, again, Possible deviation. Uh, fire detection alarm systems to EN54, uh, but also maybe as described in the Dion. Um, again, water mist system, a manual device. Uh, we're using non electrical detection devices, i.e., pneumatic systems. These should comply with 120 EN1209 4.2. Um, requirements for audible and visible alarms. Uh, again, very similar to those required in BS 9251 in the revision that Simons has been through, but also in 12845. So not a huge uh, problem there. Um, systems, uh, and here we come to the some bits that worry me slightly. Um, 
system shall have a, at least one automatic supply of water. I'm not quite sure what that means. Propellant or atomizing gas, uh, operating at the correct pressure of flow and operating in time, that's fair enough. Uh, connection of water systems with town mains, i.e. service mains, may be covered by natural river rules, that's, that's true. Uh, flow is based on flow rate of the nozzles uh, in the hydraulic most favorable area uh, or on the number of nozzles specified to operate simultaneously. Uh, likewise, the amount of gas required is, uh, should be sufficient. Um, deluge systems uh, based on the supply of the largest single protected area or group of simultaneously protected areas at maximum operating temperature uh, pressure. Uh, so again, uh, the gas. Um, discharge durations um, for residential domestic um, are essentially the lower category, i.e. dwelling houses, flats, maisonettes, transportable homes is 10 minutes. Block of flats greater than 18 meters up to 45 minutes is 60 minutes. And blocks of flats up to 18 meters, including sheltered extra care and residential accommodation is 30 minutes. Uh, I have to say, uh, as a consultant, uh, I would not be recommending uh, compliance. I would ex expect 60 minutes, uh, 30 minutes for dwellings and 60 minutes for everything else. Uh, but that's... Uh, uh, up to individuals. Um, that's one reason why I think the, the standard may not be uh, as universally popular as uh, Sen hopes it might be. Um, let's just move on there. Um, 60 minutes water supply for the occupancy shown. Again, we're back to shopping storage areas, open plan offices, restaurants and kitchens, churches, many of the libraries, fair enough. Rooms in hospitals and hotels. I, I'm not quite sure how you would just protect a room in a hospital and not the rest of the hospital, but there we are. Um, I think um, ho hotels, classrooms, and museums and libraries and other objects in this list are perhaps a mistake. Wet benches, um, twice the extinguishment time, minimum of two minutes. Uh, again, that, that may be enough. I'm not familiar with these things, so I'll probably say commercial deep fat frying cookers twice the total time it takes to extinguish the fire and cool it below the auto ignition temperature. Um, that would be probably not so different from what's currently happening. Uh, other systems, uh, twice the extinguishing time in the relevant fire tests, a minimum of 10 minutes. Um, I think we're wide open to um, uh, weasel words and, and uh, uh, de deviations here. Uh, water supply is one of the following, at least one of the following. Connection to the public water main, i.e. one connection, not a double any connection. Uh, pressurized tank or cylinder, a gravity tank, or a combination of water reservoir, i.e. tank, and automatic fire pump. Um, gas systems, uh, obviously, and gas systems, pressurized tanks and cylinders, or a combination of compressors. I'm not sure how you combine compressors. I'm not sure that's something that's uh, be a good idea. Uh, water supply, as we've already dis discussed, the most uh, maximum demand, uh, both unfavorable area. Um, water should be free from fibers or other matter. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about this because it basically says you can use mains water with an assumption that all mains water is automatically suitable. Uh, I can tell you from my own experience in the Middle East that there's mains water supplied as uh, domestic water, which is uh, salt and brackish and would not be suitable for use. So there's a problem there, um, especially at high pressure systems. Water quality should be specified by the diom. So once again, the diom could override the standard. Um, where Additional measures are required to improve system reliability and availability. This is the enhanced availability. Uh, time, med fed, time main fed from both ends, um, which is fair enough, or two water sources, or independent and a single common trunk main. Um, if one end gives the required pressure, a single booster pump should be installed. If both ends can't give the required pressure, two booster pumps will be installed. Uh, I think there might be a problem there with the UK water regulations. Um, in terms of approvals for that. Uh, I'm not sure how the water suppliers will, will view that. 
um, or gravity tank with no booster pump or storage tank with two or more pumps. Uh, and this, these are quotes, exact verbatim quotes. And you can see that the language is not in, as clear as it might be. Um, I think um, nobody would quibble with the requirements for full capacity, no entry for light and so forth, or corrosion resistance. Um, an in inexhaustible source with two or more pumps. Uh, and, and that um, is obviously something that we're familiar with, with, uh, with sprinklers. Uh, there's a reduced capacity water reservoir uh, paragraph, which I think would be not acceptable in the UK. Um, now, here's something that will cause some concern. Uh, pumps, compressors and tanks should be installed in dedicated rooms made of non-combustible construction. Uh, they should not be installed in buildings or sections of premises where there are hazardous processes and the shutoffs should be available in an even fire situation. All components to be secure against tampering and protected against freezing. Um, compartments housing the supply for the water main system to be taken by the same system or other suitable firefighting system. So again, this is a read through from sprinklers where we protect our pump houses with a sprinkler system. Uh, compartments be kept above 4C, except where diesels are installed when it's 10C. Uh, ventilation to be provided. Now, um, installation. In compliance with the standard or the DION, whichever is the most onerous, which is, which is uh, I guess, acceptable. Um, you should obviously avoid electrical hazards. Uh, not install it in the presence of HV systems unless you do a risk assessment based on EN 3.7. And the table of clearances. Now, I've installed um, numerous uh, water spray systems on uh, transformers up to 400 kV uh, and on very large turbo alternators. Uh, and these are not difficult to achieve, these clearances. So uh, this uh, suggests that. Um, the um, EN14972 parts dealing with, with um, gas turbines, uh, compression engines, they call them. Uh, this would be an entirely suitable application. Uh, and this is very welcome. So I'm very pleased to see this requirement. Uh, nozzle installation in accordance with the DIOM. Uh, only pipe with accessories as indicated in the DIOM should be used, i.e. approval of pipes in the DIOM. Uh, pipework protectors from mechanical damage, corrosion, seismic activity, and freezing. Uh, possibly not too much, much worried here about seismic, but make the point about pipework for mechanical damage that Simon mentioned earlier about CPVC. Um, pipe should be installed where it's accessible, should not be installed in masonry or concrete walls or floors unless approved by the manufacturer. Pipe bending as per the diom, uh, water pipes, supply pipes through the protected area. For the shrub duration is protected against fire. So your pipe work running through the protected area must be protected against fire for the duration of operation. Um, pipe work should be supplied, supported by the structural elements of the building. Uh, that's going to be quite hard where you have um, lightweight uh, partitions or uh, sheetrock, gypsum boards, and so forth. Pipe supports installed in compliance with the manufacturer's instructions not glued, welded, soldered pipe fittings, which is nice to have. And um, support should be installed to prevent movement, which would recoil heads into the ceiling or loft voids. Again, this is very welcome. Um, where you've got um, roof space protection, I've several times had to ask contractors to install additional supports to prevent uh, this uh, movement of the pipe work should it operate, the system operate. Strainers and filters installed throughout, and the sieves to be removed without removing the filter housing. Uh, that's going to be a difficult one, I think, for some people. Um, filters as per the diom, one shutoff valve for each system or section. And I'm not quite sure, as I mentioned earlier, section. I presume they mean zone, but of course, uh, it doesn't talk about zones. So we need to um, think about that in the UK as to how we actually handle one shutoff valve per section. Valves be identified, accessible, and provided with, uh, as provided for in the DION. Uh, shutoff valves should include an open shut indicator. 
all valves which can disable the operation of the system shall be accessible in case of fire, sorry, to be monitored, and control valves accessible in case of fire, obviously. Uh, check and non-return valves as per the diom. Pressure gauges uh, to show pressure and pressure for flow tests. Test connection located at the end of each section with discharge from the connection pipe to a safe discharge location. Uh, that's going to be difficult to achieve in some domestic situations, I think. Uh, where you can't test the system by actual flow through the nozzles, means should be provided uh, that the deluge valve is opened when activated. So that's for deluge systems. Uh, again, if you can't uh, run an actual flow test, I'm not sure why you're installing a deluge system. I, or, as a consultant, I demand a, an actual uh, visual test of the system uh, to ensure that uh, the coverage is adequate particularly important on three-dimensional objects like transformers. Um, system alarms, um, again, uh, as very much as per uh, sprinklers, uh, 1901 and 12845. Um, these uh, obviously will cover not just the usual things like pump start or pump fail to start, but also the pressurized containers, uh, low pressure, low level water, uh, and uh, general fault. The position of valves in the water flow. Um, sorry, let's just make that point there. Uh, the correct position of all main valves in the water flow, uh, I think is critical. Uh, that should be monitored remotely uh, so that we can actually look at a glance and see the system's operational. I've had some real problems where uh, control valves have been hidden in, in uh, uh, sash window enclosures uh, because they're ugly and should be concealed. Um, pumps can be connected to the main or require tanks. Again, subject to approval uh, from the uh, water company. Tanks to be protected against the ingress of contaminants. Yes, corrosion resistant, corrosion protected, or concrete, which is interesting. Um, tanks fitted with manual shutoff. Uh, drain valve overflow outfit and a refill. I'm not watching a refill. I presume it means uh, capable of being uh, refilled during the operation of the system. Wherever you can uh, take account of the likely infill. You need a method of testing the uh, cylinder valve actuators on self contained systems and a means of checking the cylinders and the water level in the cylinders. Uh, a means to measure flow and pressure should be provided in times made systems in accordance with the dion. And a means to test and measure the inflow rate to a full capacity tank of the water mist system. Now, components essentially are as per the dion um, or the relevant part of um, 174501 and the rest when they're published. Now, this is um, in my opinion, a critical factor. And uh, it's, you can't simply assume that just because a flow switch works on a sprinkler system, it's the right flow switch for a water system. So we need to worry about that. Um, the, the other issue is um, that um, pipes should be marked uh, and permanently visible. And the standard uh, for um, pressure reducing devices uh, should take account of the need uh, for the maximum operating pressure. When you work out that some MIST systems work at 200 bar, and I have heard somebody proposing a 300 bar system, uh, allowing a 50% uplift, um, you know, 450 bars is a lot of bars. Uh, flexible hoses are permitted, subject to manufacturing specifications, um, but shouldn't be used in areas where there's a class B fire uh, unless they're reinforced with wire braid other material. Uh, there are a number of proprietary systems where they're using uh, a PTFE hose, which I think uh, is a real problem. Um, okay, I think this. Pumps um, are either centrifugal or positive displacement type, or the other pumps can be used. Uh, the standards are 17451 and 12.2259 part 12, uh, and the ISO for displacement pumps. 
electric diesel or other drivers capable of providing the minimum power required, uh, filtering device at the pump suction, a shut-off valve in the pump set suction pipe unless the maximum water level is in the pump, and all valves of the pump set that can alter correct functioning shall be monitored or at least in the lock position. Um, pump set redundancy uh, has to be increased to ensure 100% pressure in the flow of any case of failure. Um, the pump set pressure should be 10% higher than that required for the hydraulically most demanding system for drivable pumps. So that's uh, already going to set your pump curve a bit higher than it is at the moment. Uh, just uh, an observation from bitter personal experience, uh, high pressure pumps have a significant starting up demand in terms of current um, to the point where they blacked out the building. So uh, do make sure that the power demand uh, for the pump is allowed for uh, and rated for the full load of the driven pumps. Uh, interestingly, there's a prohibition on any joints in the cables between the pumps and the controller. Um, short circuit protection um, where there's more than one pump from the same controller. Uh, isolating switches to have a delayed interrupting characteristic. I've not come across this before in a standard uh, of 20 seconds on the start current. And the overcurrent protection uh, where this is provided, this is rated at the sum of a locked rotor current and the full load current of fire pump accessory equipment. So it's quite a bit more than the uh, rating on the pump. Accepted commissioning, um, the following are to be checked. The fire hazard review, that's what it means, I presume, it just says fire hazard. A diom, system design and nozzle positioning, verification components, function tests and acceptance tests. Um, the system shall be commissioned in accordance with at least the following. There's a whole load of stuff. Uh, validation of pipe is clean, uh, uh, that's uh, been installed against the approved design. Uh, full functional check of the system, including activation of detectors. Uh, to be pressurized to 1.5 operating pressure for at least two hours to ensure that no leakage takes place. Um, that's quite a, an onerous test. Um, quite frankly, if it, if it pops at, uh, at that after five minutes, you know, I think. Um, it, it cautions against people in the test area, uh, so that you need to take sure take care of that. I suppose we're worried about uh, noz nozzles flying off, possibly. Um, system test is either by full discharge test, as specified the diom, or validation of the pressure and flow of the supply and free passage to all water mist nozzles by utilizing by utilizing alternative ways. Um, I have to say that that worries me. I think. Um, we, we do need to make sure that uh, the systems are valid and that every nozzle is patent and that water is free to, free to flow. That's quite hard to do uh, in a uh, pump only test. Uh, dry pipe systems, not less than 2.5 bar for 24 hours loss. So that's quite a, uh, a bit more onerous than the other, other test. Uh, alarm flow devices to be checked. Uh, remote monitoring to be checked, a commission certificate to be completed in accordance with 8.4 of the standard, and that sets out all the criteria which you can see here. Um, that's just, yeah, a completion of as-built drawings, including identification of all valves, and the service and maintenance schedule. Um, inspection and maintenance. The standard specifies weekly, monthly, quarterly routines, um, very much as for a sprinkler system. And I suspect in many cases, this will be carried out by the, the owner or the uh, uh, user, the client. Um, pumps will be started weekly, and there should be a diesel engine restarting test, which is a bit more onerous than sometimes has been imposed. Uh, half yearly test requires exercising dry and deluge valves and test and detection systems as specified. The annual inspection hazard review, which we all used to, a visual inspection of nozzles, 
uh, pump set flow test, diesel engine build start test, infill valves on one story tanks, pump and system strainers, pump and pipe work and pipe supports, examination cylinders and tanks, remote alarm transition and system integrity. Um, the overriding requirement is it says there's a minimum once a year or more frequently required, the system shall be maintained according to the dial. So we expect to find the M in dial, the maintenance bit, uh, specifying perhaps slightly more onerous things than is in the standard. There are three yearly, five yearly, ten year routines. Three yearly essentially is the st water storage tanks, uh, including repainting if required, uh, plus all water supply, shower valves, and control and check valves. Testing of nozzles, five yearly. This is more onerous than sprinklers. Uh, two nozzles per section shall be removed from various parts of the system. The nozzle shall then be tested to BSEN 12259 part one um, for function, K factor of any temperature and thermal response. Uh, I suspect the 12259 uh, part one is a mistake because there will be a, a part of the um, missed suite for nozzles. And I think that will be a, a more appropriate standard. 12259.1 is called sprinkler heads. Uh, 10 unit test is uh, storage tanks be cleaned, examined externally, and the fabric attended to. Pipe work flushed and inspected at the point of the dial. Uh, the user shall provide be provided with a monitoring program for the system and components in the corner of the dial. Uh, this will include action taken in the direct of faults. Um, persons who can be expected to inspect, test, maintain, or operate the system shall be trained. Uh, I recently handled litigation where um, a company had a CO2 discharge system failure. And one of the, uh, the points that the, um, uh, the defendant uh, raised significantly was the fact that um, they had offered training to the uh, owner of the system, but his staff had not been trained in it. And uh, it was his view that that contributed toward the failure of the operating system. That's worth thinking about. Uh, documentation is set out in 10.1. I'm not going to go through this, but it basically covers everything you could think of and a bit more. Uh, and don't overlook the contractor's declaration of conformity as required in Annex NB. Um, so lots of lots of documents be provided. Um, you're talking about three or four volumes of folders here. Okay, um, I'm sorry if that's been terribly tedious and long-winded, uh, but it's hard to know what to put in and what to leave out. Uh, I think my conclusions are that the justification, uh, the reservations expressed uh, by the UK reps on the Working Group 5 were justified. Um, not only the technical issues where the content of the EN is less rigorous than the equivalent BS, but much of the syntax is tortuous and could be open to interpretation. Uh, the lack of technical rigor does nothing to reinforce the value of water mist. And this is not going to help the attitude of some regulators and insurers. I think the reliance on the manufacturer's dion uh, abrogates much of the value of having a technical standard. Um, there's no reference to selection of systems or discussion on whether a high pressure might be a low pressure or vice versa. And until such time as BS 8489 and 8458 are withdrawn, it's my personal view, I add personal view, that specifiers, installers, and end users might be better off using these standards. Uh, I certainly shall be with my clients. Stuart, thank you very much indeed for your presentation, and also Simon before that for your presentation. Um, I we have received many questions, of which Simon has been directly answering several as Stuart has been speaking. We also received uh, many tens of questions in advance uh, of the seminar. So uh, thank you very much for these questions. We will try and address some of them now. Others we will address after the event. Please rest assured that all of you will get a copy of the recording of this, including the Q&A. Um, and um, I like to now sort of open the panel and uh, address a couple of these questions. The first, uh, which is for Simon. Simon, um, 
Martin Hartley has asked, um, it's quite a long question. Uh, I wonder why the BSI committee who developed this update of BS 9251 felt they could downgrade the size of AMAOs of commercial areas such as car parks in table four against the requirements of the LPC rules. Um, it, in the car parks example, I mentioned the greater use of lithium ion batteries in cars is only likely to increase in the future. And this present, pre prevents an even greater fire challenge. Um, both in terms of the fire load and time to control the, the design criteria is BSEN 12845 intended to cater for and current research indicates the sprinkler discharge density. An AMAO will very probably increase to more like 12.5 mil min over 260 square meters, not reduce as suggested in BS 9251-2021. Simon. Thank you. Um, well, there's quite a few issues within that question. So the first point I'd like to make is I don't think table four and the areas akin to OH section, I don't think it does downrate the protection relative to 12845 or the LPC rules. Um, I think that's incorrect. But, uh, what I mean by that is everything in table four that has a 72 meter squared area of operation is basically OH1. So that is uh, directly equivalent. Anything that's capped at 100 meters squared um, probably was OH2 or possibly even higher. So, for example, a car park. Um, the issue is um, clause 5.6 is clearly limited to 100 meters squared. So you should never be having any of these areas in a compartment greater than 100 meters squared. So there is no need to take the area of operation higher than that. So I think that's partly where the misunderstanding comes from. Um, if if there are sort of remaining concerns on that point, if um, Martin could write to BSI and raise his concerns, I'm sure the committee would be happy to have a look at it. Obviously, it's a bit difficult to do that now, now that the standard's been published, having had an ample consultation period, etc. But I'm fairly confident there's not actually an issue here. Um, the issue about um, future or current common um, propulsion methods, batteries, hydrogen, etc. Yep. I think we're all aware that changes on the horizon. As far as I'm aware, the N12845 LPC rules hasn't actually um, updated, uprated its protection requirements as of now. I don't think there is research. I know research has been done, but I don't think uh, conclusions have been drawn. And um, I don't think the regulator has issued a diktat on which way we need to go in order to protect buildings, etc. So that's not something we could just do. Um, yeah. Does that pick it up? Does that cover most aspects of the query? I hope so, Martin. I hope you're happy with that query. Simon, whilst we're, um, Stuart is looking at his questions, I'll keep you busy on another question. Yeah. Stephen Fretwell asks, for blocks of flats over 18 metres, he understands that previously category two was the requirement and that meant 30 minutes discharge. Now 60 minutes on buildings over 18 mil is the requirement, 18 metres is the requirement. Was this a change from 2014 or was it not clear before? Um, it is a change, but, um, but, but, but in 2014, as I reminded people in my presentation, the requirements were always minima. So the 30 minutes was always a minimum. So you could always increase it if necessary. And if you were doing a very thorough consultation with the Fire and Rescue Service and it was a very high rise building, I have happened upon instances where they have said, look, we're not getting up that building within 30 minutes. So using 2014 I have had several projects where we opted for more than 30 minutes and that's now reflected in the published best practice. Um, the footnote E is important for designers and I would encourage them to use it to achieve efficient designs but that's part of the consultation process. Thank you very much um, and another one because Stuart is obviously very busy trying to uh, look at all the questions that have been addressed to him. Um, Martin also asked uh, that Table 4 refers to area of operation, which is universally interpreted as the maximum fire size to cater for, not maximum compartment size to be considered. Table 4, therefore, is very likely to be misinterpreted and larger compartments of commercial risk could be seen as being covered by this new 9251-2021. I think I partly answered that in my previous response to Martin. Um, BS9251 is different in its approach and philosophy to the LPC rules slash 12845. And I don't think we have downrated anything. 
um, I mean, mistakes aside or whatever. Um, but it should be broadly equivalent. And we must remember that the compartment size is limited to 100 meters squared. We don't want people abusing this allowance for ordinary hazard akin areas in 9251. But the fact was, all residential buildings have non-residential areas and people were just ignoring that and glossing over it. They weren't going to 12845 and fully implementing an NLPC rules 12845 system. So this was seen as a sensible, proportionate way to address that problem. and. Um, result in you know considerably better systems than might have been the case historically. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Stuart, Mark Thompson has asked where water mist systems are used as a trade-off during the planning stage if a building cannot comply with B5 access requirements, what guarantees are there that the system will be maintained by the present and future owners of the property? Um, very good question. Uh, the answer is, I, I don't know, but I, I would imagine there's no guarantees. Um, the, the, obviously, um, if the system has been provided um, for the safety of life, uh, which is what we're talking about for residential premises, then under the fire safety order, there's a legal requirement to maintain the system in good working order uh, with equivalent requirements in Scotland on the Fire Scotland Act. Um, so that's there, but how you actually enforce that and whether or not the fire and rescue service um, have the resources to come round and verify uh, that the system is in good working order uh, based on a trade-off, I don't know. Um, I have to say my, my understanding at the moment is that water mist is not widely being accepted as a trade-off. It is being accepted in the case of non statutory requirements in certain dwellings, and it's being provided as a supplementary requirement in some places, but I don't think too many are being installed as trade-offs, because there, there are concerns from building control and certainly from the insurers. Thank you, I hope that answers your question. Um, Paul Charlesworth has asked, regarding the water volumes within a shared sprinkler domestic water tank, you know, PDV, is it required to provide double the peak domestic water storage volume plus the sprinkler water? Good question. This question keeps coming up. Um, I, it's not my area of expertise, actually, this particular design, design approach. It's not one I commonly use um, or sort of it's never my first, the one I first reached for. I think the buffer volume has to be at least 100% of the domestic demand fluctuation. Otherwise, you're going to get constant nuisance, nuisance alarms with the low level switch. I, I appreciate the BS doesn't say that, but I think you would quickly arrive at that as being the only possible conclusion. Otherwise, you're risking domestic demand being less than anticipated and crossing your fingers that you won't get alarms. How else can it be? Um. Stuart, Doug McKinnon is, ask, um, is mentioning the Welsh Government guidance on water mist written by BRE representatives does not mention our other third party certification bodies, i.e. FIRES or IFC, who have UCAS accredited installer schemes. As the document is under the Welsh Government, is this considered fair representation of the TPCs? I, I'm sorry, Wendy, I couldn't hear any of that. Okay. The Welsh Government guidance on water mist written by BRE representatives does not mention other third party certification bodies, i.e. FIRES or IFC, who have UCAS accredited in installer schemes. As the document is under the Welsh Government, is this considered fair representation of the TPCs? Um, uh, I've never ever criticised the BRE for anything um, in my long career working for bits of it that were spun off. Um, of, of course it is. Um, and in fact, it's one of the things that we commented on and we, we hope would be amended in, in the final draft. Uh, unless the BRE are saying that the UCAS approvals for IFCC and FIRAS are not valid, um, they, they should include everything. Right. Um, John Lewis is asking, he's keen to learn about 14972 and how it sits alongside BS8458. Also, the validity of 14972 for water mist systems, which do not meet 8458, 
but which are proposed within new dwellings as being suitable for use in the situations listed in Table 2 of BS 991. Can you, have you got anything to say on that, Stuart? Um, well, it, I mean, in theory, uh, BRE, sorry, BSI should have withdrawn 8458 already. Uh, so we, we don't really know what's happening. Um, and 4972 doesn't sit alongside it. it. It supplants it under, as I say, under the Vienna Agreement, it should be withdrawn. But um, it may well be that BSI have accepted that there are some concerns, genuine concerns, about the quality of the standard. Um, I'm not quite sure what John means by um, water based systems that don't meet 8458. Uh, I presume he means uh, things like um, Plumis. Uh, it, it, I have to say that um, until there's a standard, uh, a public consensus, um, peer-reviewed standard for plumage type systems, I would have difficulty in supporting their application in situations as uh, proposed in 9991. Don't forget 9991 are trade-offs, so you're getting a benefit from this. Uh, you're not putting the system in out of the goodness of your heart. As, as many systems are installed by responsible property owners. So uh, if you want to get the trade off, I think you need to make sure that the, the system will comply. Um, and the testing that's been done by Plumis, and it is extensive and exhaustive, uh, they're spending a vast amount of money, I know, with UL on testing all of their components. Um, uh, but until there's actually a standard that we can refer to uh, and that uh, building control or AIs and the fire service can refer to uh, with a listing process. Um, I, I don't know what the answer is. Given that LABC uh, have a, a form of approval and they have approved um, auto scan and, and the uh, auto mist, um, I guess from that perspective, you could make a case that the system is approved. So that would may negate my own arguments, but uh, as I say, it's not one that I'm, I'm hugely happy about. Thank you. An anonymous attendee is asking, we have seen an increase of blocks of townhouses, four storey with four to six bedrooms for students, each have their own ground floor access front door. Would these be classed as category one? Simon? Yeah, I don't know, actually, not my area of expertise. Um, that perhaps they're HMOs, according to the table, or perhaps they're student accommodation, according to the table. Stuart, would you mind jumping in? I think this is more your well, expertise than mine. I, I think it's, it's you can't build an HMO. Um, you know, that's been made very clear to me over the years by the government. Uh, HMOs are converted and never built. Um, student accommodation has some characteristics of an HMO in that uh, it's shared communal living. Um, but um, if you've got your own front door uh, and it looks like a house um, and it's uh, self-contained, you could make a case it's a category one. But again, it's not one I'd want to go to court on. I think we, we need guidance from, from um, government on this one. Thank you. I would at this stage say to many people who are asking design questions, that we will address these direct with our design training facilitator, who will have answers to all of them at the tips of his fingers. So we may not look at any of those or many more of those today, but thank you very much. Uh, questions are still coming in. Um, and I would like to, some of them are very long, so forgive me, but a question, a very quick question. Will a registered installer be required to carry out the work under 9251? Um, so there's no legislative requirements to use third party certification, much to everyone's frustration, disappointment, and there's no, yes, I can't require it, but clearly it is best practice. So we should all be advocating that and we should all be using the most competent providers we reasonably can. Thank you, Simon. Um, and also another uh, brief question, perhaps. Do you see water mist systems being designed to provide in-rack protection, Stuart? This is my old friend David Smith being mischievous. <laughs> um, I, I don't, this is a simple answer. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that mist 
have more in common with um, gas systems than sprinkler systems in some areas. And I would have thought in a very large warehouse, the, the, um, even with the most optimum flux density, you're not going to guarantee getting the water in the right place at the right time. I, I simply cannot see uh, mist being used either in warehouses of any kind, far less alone um, high bay, uh, and certainly not in rack. Um, that's my personal view. I'm, I'm sure there'll be lots of people out there willing to prove me wrong and produce kit that will do it. But uh, I mean, the simple question is why would you want to do that? Why would you not want not use sprinklers? I think in rack storage, you rely on big droplets, which can yeah. maintain velocity and momentum to penetrate the stack. I mean, you probably could contrive a water mist solution, but it would be so case by case. And if you move one box, it would be a different. I just think that's not really the way to go, to be honest. And if somebody invents an ESFR mist system, I don't know. Thank you very much. Donald Aiken refers to uh, Scottish legislation where sprinklers are required in certain domestic premises. Where these domestic dwellings are above retail or commercial spaces, it is his understanding that the building standards do not require the non-domestic areas to have sprinklers. How is this addressed within BS 9251, as there are references to non-domestic areas and the installation sprinkler of same to EN 12845, but no definition as to when this case should or should not apply in a combined development? I think BS 9251 in a few places does stress that the whole building should be protected. And if you look in England, approved document B, it also wants the whole building to be sprinkler protected um, um, and what it means is in a vertical plane so everything above and below should be sprinkler protected the exception is where you've got something off to the side adequately separated then that might uh, be acceptable to not sprinkler protect that um, and yeah where you've got shops retail whatever below um, if it's a little in-house um, costa or little concession shop then clearly that's within bs 9251 and the limited areas of OH, but if it's a you know a mini supermarket, a Waitrose local, Tesco's Metro, whatever, if it's one of them, then clearly that's that's not within 9251 because it's going to exceed the area, and obviously you would have to go to 12845 in that case. Yeah, can, can I add, Simon? Um, this is something we had a lot of in Hong Kong, um, where we had um, supermarkets uh, um, and other retail below. Uh, quite large blocks of flats. Uh, and the, the answer there was, if the developer didn't want to sprinkle uh, either the flats or the, sh the store, there had to be at least a two hour slab between them. Uh, and I think um, that fits in well with uh, the EN 12845 requirement, where you've got sprinkled and unsprinkled areas in proximity, there has to be a significant fire barrier between the two to prevent the sprinklers from being overwhelmed. Thank you, Stuart. Um, does the 2021 standard have to be used throughout the industry as of its release date earlier this year? Um, again, my personal view is no standard has to have to be used. Uh, it's, it, the standard is a, a useful reference uh, for end users and clients when procuring systems. If the uh, end user decides to use a different standard, uh, and we know, for example, that many UK companies don't use EN 12845, but use NFPA 13 or FM data sheets. Uh, so because the standards are not harmonized in terms of uh, any kind of uh, regulations, uh, and certainly weren't harmonized in the European regulations, uh, you're free to use what you want. Um, even if and when BSI remove um, 845, 8489, um, it will still be available. You can still download it or buy it. And if you want to use it, um, that's a matter between you and your, and your client. Uh, it may create some situations uh, with um, overly zealous lawyers uh, or uh, quantity surveyors. Uh, but, uh, you know, essentially, if you agree that something's acceptable, um, I believe that Tesco have their own sprinkler standard. I, I know that certainly Shell have. Um, I believe also that um, one or two other companies have their own standards. So it, it, may, it, it may well be that um, uh, that's what will happen. Thank you. 
Um, one more for Simon. Figure one of BS9251 replicates ADB for height of top story measurement of plant rooms. However, plant rooms should be sprinkle protected to clause 5.4 as a commercial risk. Where the plant room or any other commercial areas exceed 100 square meters, then BS9251 is not appropriate and BSEN 12845 or LPC rules should be applied. Uh, this is from Dale Kinsley, who notes, accepts this notice page 16 of the standard, but shouldn't this be communicated more obviously to system specifiers? Um, yeah, thanks, Dale. Okay. Um, well, I agree with what you're saying in that above 100 square meters, you should go to 12845, and that's what the standard says. Um, it's on page 16, it's part of clause 5.6, it's normative text as opposed to commentary or a note, so it's a requirement. I mean, maybe we should have put it on page one, but, you know, other stuff's on page one. Again, Thank you, Simon. Can I come in, Wendy? Of um, course. I agree completely with what Simon said. I think Dale's observations in his little article, which has been widely published, uh, misunderstands uh, the relationship between BS9251 and the insurers. BS9251 is a life safety standard there to protect the occupants of, of buildings, allow them to escape and to minimize the impact of fire by containing it. Um, it has no insurance application because I've never heard of any insurer um, either re requiring the 9251 system or giving credit for it in terms of premium. In fact, we know that one or two insurers have actually loaded premiums because they're worried about water damage. So um, I think it's slightly disingenuous to say that um, the revised 9251, which tries to facilitate uh, the wider use of sprinklers throughout a building. Um, if the building is a block of flats, then that's the occupancy. If that includes peripherally things like storerooms and plant rooms and small offices uh, and hairdressing salons in, inside care homes and so on, and kitchens and laundries, then you know we're trying to protect those the best we can. But the alternative would be to exclude the sprinkler protection from that area and put two hour firewalls around them which would be very, very unpopular. Thank you, Stuart. And I would like now to say thank you to everybody who's attended, but I would like to thank Simon for his presentation and his time today. And I'd like to thank Stuart for his time today. And for all of you who have joined us today, I hope you have found it rewarding. We will be sending out the recordings. We will also endeavor to address most of your questions in the coming days. If you've not been able to sit through all of this or missed the beginning, we are uh, running a, a similar webinar on October the 7th. And uh, just keep an eye on the BAFSA website for what we're doing in the future. Once again, thank you for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>